us, God. God, we're not going to look at circumstances because when you're in the room, God, nothing else matters. Everything else bows to you, God, because you are high and lifted up. You are righteous and you are holy, God. And we stand in awe of your presence, God. We stand in awe of your presence, God. You are holy and we worship you, God. And we reverence you this morning, God, knowing, God, that you are our source and our strength, God. God, so we turn all of ourselves over to you, God. God, this room belongs to you. As people are coming on the property, as people are driving by, God, let your spirit draw them, Father God. You said no man comes lest the spirit draws, God. So, God, in the name of Jesus, God, God, we release, oh God, your spirit to move in this place. And we come against anything that is not in perfect harmony with you, God. God, that you may be glorified and exalted, God. That our hearts may be touched. That minds may be renewed and restored, God. That souls will be saved, God. God, I ask that you pierce the heart of the unbeliever, God. That today the scales will be removed from their eyes.
appointed times, Moedim, first fruits, Passover, and Feast of Tabernacle. If you don't know by now, we are a word church. And the word of God says, I want you to do this and teach your children to do this. And I want you to do it forever. This isn't an Old Testament practice. This is a forever practice. And I'm telling you, if you've never participated in Moedim, the appointed times, God is a God of seasons. God is a God of appointments. And you don't want to miss your appointment with God. So if you need a Passover envelope, raise your hand. The ushers will bring you one. We're going to have Bishop come. We're going to place this offering in the hand of the man of God according to the instructions of the word. And it says that he is going to pronounce a blessing over our household. That he will speak the seven promises of God over our household. That he will be an enemy to our enemies. That he'll rebuke sickness and disease from our houses. And that he will keep us in adversity. Come on somebody. How many know these can be trying times? But like God said, we're his children. Do you know that we can be exempt from the challenges of this world? Everybody else around us can be going through adversity and struggle. And we could be prospering. Do you know during COVID was one of the most prosperous seasons of my life financially? I didn't struggle during COVID. You got to understand. And I never took one subsidy from the government, not one. And not one day did I go in lack, but I came out on the other side of COVID with an increase and my financial portfolio. Come on, somebody. Because of God's blessing and anointing on my life, he is faithful. So at this time, I want you to come. If you've already participated in Passover, I want you to stand and join with us as we bring forth our offering and we place it in the hand of the man of God. I want you to be prayerful. I want you to get something in the forefront of your mind. God, I need a move in my life in this area. God, I need you to move, oh God. God, these are the promises according to your word, God. These are the things you said you would do, oh God. If I walked in obedience to Moedim, the appointed time, I come faithfully, God, placing it in your hand, God knowing that you're going to move on our behalf. Come on now, lift your hands all over this place. Father, as we stand here in covenant, in obedience to your word, we come with this special offering, God, and we're saying that we believe your word and we stand on your promise. And I know that you're able to rebuke the devourer for our sake. That God, you'll go before us in our household, in our family, in our finances, that, that you will restore, you will rebuild, you will renew. You will refresh and you will refire your children. That God, you become an enemy to every one of our enemies. As we stand on your word and your promise, that sickness will not have a stronghold in my life, nor in my household. It will not have a stronghold in my children's life. Addiction will be broken in the name of Jesus. Lack will be broken in the name of Jesus. Generational curses will be broken in the name of Jesus. As we stand on your word and your promise, we give you praise, we give you thanks, we give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Let everyone shout amen. 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 You may be seated. So I just want, I have a quick announcement. Those of you who are participating in the groundkeeping, the groundskeeping team, I need you to see Deacon Ron Coates. Ron, give him a wave. He's the guy who turns red when he plays the guitar. But he's worshiping his king, man. Red for Jesus. Amen. I love it. And for those of you, you can't see, but when Ron is really worshiping, his feet come off the floor and he starts moving, boy. But I just love to watch him worship because he loves his Jesus and his Jesus loves his Ron. Amen. Amen. So see him immediately following second service and uh, meet with him and he has some instruction. At this time, we're going to have uh, Sister Holly come. She has the team that's doing the presentation for 12 years of ministry. Whoop, whoop, 12 years. Yes. I just, you know what? It was, it's 
sucked you weren't here last week. But this just means it's another week to celebrate 12 years. Hallelujah. God knows what he's doing. So we just, again, we want to extend just the most sincere, profound thank you to the two of you. And, and um, you know, you hear from a number of us a lot. But there's some people that absolutely adore you that really want to, to express to you what this has meant to them. So I'd like to first call up Deacon Johnson, please. What can I say? I've, I've known these two since they were teenagers. And I watched them grow and mature. And I think we are totally blessed to have this type of leadership and take it from me. I was out there. And I, I watched them grow and I was drawn in and their leadership has kept me strong in the Lord. So I'm just letting you know I'm still here. Next, we'd like to ask Tayo to come up, please. Amen. So they asked me to talk about 12 years in two minutes. That's not possible. <laughs> okay, so I'm trying to make it as brief as possible. Um, I've been with this ministry actually for 12 years now. And I want to tell you, having been in churches probably across the world, Africa, Asia, even in the Middle East, and coming here, I know the benefits and the blessings that we have. But uh, the challenge is many of us, because we see them on a daily basis, we don't appreciate the gifts of God that we have. They are servants of God. That means they're also accountable, right? But I can give it to you. When they see it in you, they don't let go. They push you. And when you have leaders who are transparent that can even admit their mistakes, it's another level. So I just want to say, God bless you. Keep doing what you're doing. And we are praying for you. Amen. And next, we'd like Miss Betty to come up. <laughs> I've been so ready to express my gratitude to these two. Oh, when Rose messaged me and asked me if I would mind saying a couple of words, I grabbed my dog and took him for a walk and I was just like, whew, I was gonna write it all down. I was gonna write it, I had so much to say. And I'm a, I'm a note taker, I'm, I'm good about dates. So I wanted to go back and she asked me, when did you come to this ministry? And so I remembered the service that I first texted Bishop and I told him how much it moved me. But when I went back to those messages, there were so many messages prior to that because I had originally come when you were at Dougal. It was actually on your birthday when you were welcoming people because I remember making an offering. And I went to one service, but because I was raised in the Catholic church and it was about guilt and condemnation, when I sat in the back of the church, I felt unworthy, so I stayed away. Oh, but Bishop, you sent me message after message after message, <laughs> reminding me that I had a home. So one day that I did finally go, on July 24, 2022, I was sitting on my porch, hmm, full of resentment and bitterness, getting ready to go to work, chain smoking, and just hating my life, hating my job, hating everything. I didn't want to get out of bed, but the Lord gave me a dog, and he said, get out of bed, because you got responsibilities, you got some, something that depends on you. I was going through Facebook, and I came across a message by Tim, saying, come check us out. It was a public message. And at that very moment, I knew, I knew, I knew I was being called home. So I went to work. 
And I was like, oh, Lord, if there's any way that I can go, please make it so. And I was scheduled on the patio. Well, the day started with sunshine, but oh, it started to rain. And my shift got canceled. And I jumped into my car and I went to Kabodo. And I remember walking into that building, not even into the room, into the building, and I could hear Stephanie sing. And I started crying because I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew that I was home. I knew it. Oh. So I went to work and I said, no more Sundays for me. No more Sundays for me. And what's funny about that is just, just prior to that Sunday, Katie had suggested that I take the weekends off because I was full of vinegar. I was just an angry person at work. And I said, I'm not giving up my weekends. No, that's a money weekend, like money making days. Oh, but after that Sunday, after that Sunday, Oh, I went rushing in there going, I need Sundays off and eventually Saturdays off because I am going to praise my Lord. I'm going to be led under my bishop and my pastor. You're not only here for us in the church, and I know I was supposed to keep it short, but shh, I'm last, so that's okay. Uh, <laughs> bishop and pastor are those people that get back to you. I'm an early riser, so I wake up with moments of revelation and breakthrough. And I'm on my phone texting them at 4.30 in the morning. And he gets right back to me. I'm thinking, oh, did I wake him? But no, no, no. And they know, they know what I, I need them when I'm at work. And they show up when I'm having that, that moment. And the Lord brings them in. I am so grateful for you. You have changed my life drastically. And I've had a weekend of confirmations, and you this morning were saying, welcome home. This is a place where you are unconditionally loved. For the first time in my life, I am unconditionally loved. I am, I'm not based on what I am doing. I'm not based on past failures. It's unconditional, and I feel it in every, every cell of my body. God bless you. Thank you for changing my life. Well, you're not going to top that at all. We're not even going to try. I, I want to thank our three speakers I, because each of you did offer something very profound to your experience. And we, we thank you for the confirmation of Deacon Johnson and Tayo and, um, and, and Betty. We just thank you for just being you. No, seriously. Thank you for being you. Um, you know what? I think. Betty's a testament to the ministry of 12 years where you can come in as you are and they will help raise you up as you are so that God can use you for the reason he put you here. So praise team's one thing, but Betty's on fire and we're going to see where else she's going to go. So just to say thank you again, we've got this card we want to give to Pastor because you got all the ones last week. <laughs> thank you both so much. We appreciate you. And just bask in this. I know you got... We do this because you're far too humble to toot your own horn. And this is the best part about what I get to do and what Betty and Tayo and the rest of us and Deacon Johnson get to do. We will toot your horn any day. Thank you so much. Praise God. Well, I just want to thank everyone that's here because your presence matters. If there's one thing I can share with you today, and that's, that's really what I was trying to express, because oftentimes when you're committed to something, it can be misconstrued that your presence really isn't making the impact that you desire it to make. And my absence last week, so many people reached out to me and we're like, Pastor, we miss you so much. Are you okay? Are you? And it was just such a blessing to me because when you're serving the Lord, a lot of times as pastors, people see the glory. They don't know the glory. They don't know the sacrifice. They think 
that it's all, you know, everybody loves you and everybody wants to shower you with things, but you don't see the secret sacrifice. You don't see the tears. You don't see the times where I have to encourage him and he has to encourage me. I just thank God there's two of us because I can't imagine being a pastor and being single and not having that person that can has your back because the sheep, the blood of the shepherds was never intended to be put on the sheep. We were supposed to carry your blood. Amen? Amen. So I just want you to know your presence matters. Don't ever think, you know, if I don't show up, I'm just one person. I don't make a difference. Every person in this room has purpose. Every person in this, look at your neighbor and say, you matter. I want you to look at him again and tell him, you're my miracle. Because the very things that you have been praying for are sitting right next to you in this room. Amen. Praise God. So take the love and the gift that you are outside of these walls and show the love of God. And I'm telling you, your living is not in vain. The more the enemy tries to convince me to stop, the more the passion and the power of the Holy Ghost stokes up the fire on the inside of me. And you've heard me say it before. I had a man tell me when I first gave my heart to Christ, oh, you poor thing. When you settle down in the Lord, you'll understand. And that very moment, I looked back at that man and I thought, you poor thing. Because you've given up on the passion and the fire that God put down on the inside of you. I don't have to stop burning with the love and the passion of God. So every time I felt like my flames were starting to dwindle, I'd start calling down the fire of heaven to remind me of what God delivered me from, how he saved my soul, how he has a plan and a purpose for my life. So I want to encourage you to do the same thing. God bless you. I look forward to many, 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 many more years until the Lord calls us up in the rapture, until it's time to go home. I want to go serving. I want to go shouting. I want to go winning souls. I want to go kicking the devil's butt. I want to be a pain in the enemy's backside every single morning that I get up, and I want to bring God glory. Amen. So God bless you. We thank God every day for the opportunity to represent him in the kingdom of God. Amen. You ready, Bishop? How many are ready for the word of God this morning? All right, get to your feet and put your hands together and tell the man of God, preach, Bishop, preach. Come on and give God a praise in this house. Oh, come on and give God a praise in this house. Is he worthy of our praise? I said, is he worthy of our praise? Amen and amen and amen and amen. Well, how many have been blessed this week with the encounter? I'm telling you, as you're being seated all over this house, this weekend has just blown me away. It has been a fire weekend. We have truly had an encounter with the presence of God. The first night we had my friend Pastor Gray from Chillicothe, Ohio. I mean, he tore the place up. He tore the place up. But they stopped him at the border, didn't want to let him in. But how many know when God has something for you, there's no devil in hell that can stop you. And so he pressed his way through, made it here, and brought the word. And then last night, we had my good friend, Pastor all the way from Arizona, Bishop Holmes was in the house last night, and he prayed and ministered and prayed and ministered, and we went out last night, didn't get home until like 1 o'clock in the morning, and, and I said, listen, man, I love you, but you got to go back to the hotel, because I'm tired, and, 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 and I set my alarm clock for quarter to 5, and I got home at like 1.30. And so I've been up talking to God since quarter to five. And then I woke up, and while I was talking to God, my body came under attack. And I was like, the devil is a lie. We're going to keep on preaching. We're going to keep on serving. And I'll tell you why. It's because God's not finished. This weekend is not done. 
Did y'all hear what I said? I said, God's not finished and the weekend is not done. We're going to continue. So if you're ready to continue the matter, I want you to stand to your feet, grab your Bible, look at your neighbor, say, neighbor, if you don't have a Bible, come on, look on mine. I got the word today. Come on, I got a word for somebody today. And I know without a shadow of a doubt before I even get into it, I got about that much to get through because I was studying this word. Look, I got about that. Are y'all seeing what I'm seeing? I got about that much to get through. And I don't think I'm going to get through that. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to encourage you right now. I'm probably going to get through maybe a third. But the best is at the end. And so if you have the opportunity to stay for the second service, you might want to stay for the second service. If there were ever a day you want to stay for the second service, look at your neighbor and say, today's probably that day. Turn with me to the book of Judges, chapter 3. I got about 20 minutes. Oh, my God. Okay, I said a third. It's not, I might be an eighth. We're going to get an eighth of this in. We're going to introduce this text <laughs> in the first service. Judges chapter 3. Y'all got it? I'm going to read verses 12 through 15 from the New Living Translation. But if your Bible says Holy Bible on it, I don't care what version you have, you should be okay. And the Bible says in Judges chapter 3 verse 12, once again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. I could stop right there and preach. Did, did, did y'all catch that? <clears throat> the, the first two words just kind of jumped out at once again. Come on, I know I'm talking to the right crowd. How many can say, here I am again, Lord? I, I, once again, the children of God did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave King Eglon of Moab control over Israel because of their evil. Eglon <clears throat> enlisted the Ammonites and the Amalekites as allies. And then he went out and defeated Israel, taking possession of Jericho, the city of Palms. And the Israelites served Eglon of Moab for 18 years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord again raised up a rescuer to save them. And his name was Ehud, son of Gerar, and a left-handed man of the tribe of Benjamin. Before you see that, I need you to touch about three people around you and tell them, say, neighbor, don't mess with me. I'm not normal. Come on, you need to tell two more people that. Say, neighbor, don't mess with me. I'm not normal. <laughs> I'm not, I, am I talking, come on, that was two, but tell one more person, neighbor, don't mess with me. I'm not normal. Can I get an amen up in here, anybody? This morning, it's, it's my desire to speak to those who are, who are different by design. Is there anybody in here today that knows you're different? Come on. You, you, you know you're not normal. Uh, it, it seems to me as though we live in a day and an age where, where everybody wants to be like somebody other than who God really intended them to be. In, in, in my day, some 40, 50 years ago, everybody wanted to be like, I can see you all just told your age. Somebody say, I won't be like Mike. I won't be like Mike. I want, I want to be like Mike. You, you either wanted to be like, like Mikey Uh, he, he was the one on the cereal box who, who refused to eat anything until one day his friends challenged him to try life cereal. And life cereal quickly became Mikey's meal of choice. Or you wanted to be like Michael Jackson, a man who wore short pants, bedazzled socks, one glove, and a red jacket that was filled with unnecessary zippers. Who constantly denied the rumor that Billy Jean's kid really was? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Or you wanted to be like Michael Jackson, who, or Michael Jordan, who, who would jump from the free throw line with his tongue hanging out of his mouth, leaving his opponent standing in awe because it appeared as though this man was the first and only human being to ever defy gravity, hence taking on the name Air. Jordan, and if you could afford a pair of 
Air Jordan shoes, you could actually fly like Mike. Somebody say everybody wanted to be like Mike. But that was 40, 50 years ago. Nowadays, it's not cool to be like Mike. Nowadays, it's cool to be like somebody who stands out for controversial reasons. Okay, stay with me. I'm coming to see you. So, so somebody got out of jail one day with their belt in their pants and, and, and no, no belt in their pants and no shoelaces in their shoes and, and was seen walking down the street with their pants sagging beneath their butt and it started a movement. Two young ladies one day were walking down the street holding hands and, and they were just merely friends but, but when somebody saw them, they followed the lead and, and it started. Y'all know what I'm saying? Somebody thought it would be cool to wear a, a Furby costume to school one day as a sign of defiance to authority and suddenly it started a movement. Okay, y'all didn't get that because you really don't know what Furbies are, do you? For those of you that don't know what Furbies are, um, I only got 20 minutes. So I'm going to give you a quick little uh, Furbies. There's this new movement going on, on on people that that identify as animals. And they put on different Furby costumes. They, you, but however you identify, you might have a cat costume because you identify as a cat. Somebody might want to be a dog. Somebody say ain't nothing but the dog in me. <laughs> Bow, wow, wow, yippee. Okay, so, 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 so they identify as dogs, so they put on dog costumes. And, and here's what's crazy. Just to tell you all, I'm telling you the truth. Uh, my, my grandson, my granddaughter, and my nephew went to the park, the Miracle Park, down there on Wyandotte last week. While they were there playing on the jungle gym of the Miracle Park, there just happened to be a group of Furbies in the park. And, and, and my son, my grandson, who is nine years old, because, because we teach our grandchildren about identity. It's something about teaching your child who they really are, family. Come on, don't, don't you ever stop teaching your children who they really are. I'm not talking about teaching them what they identify as. I'm not talking about teaching them, oh, this is how you feel this morning. Today you can be a girl. Tomorrow you can be a boy. Tomorrow you can be a cat. Oh, y'all, y'all ain't helping me. I'm talking about teaching them this is what God says you are. This is who God, God has a plan for your life. Every now and then you got to teach your grandbabies and your great grandbaby. This is your real idea. Y'all hear what I'm saying this morning? So my grandson, knowing who he is at nine, looked at these crazy teenagers who were dressed up like animals. And the animals were walking around barking and meowing and with their costumes on. So my granddaughter grabbed her cell phone and videoed her little son or her little brother who was my grandson because my grandson felt it funny that these people don't really know who they are. So he got down on all fours and started barking at the boy that had a dog costume on. People started calling the pet control. That's a joke, I added that to it. But, 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 but folk are looking around like, what is going on? Because these teenagers who are 18, 19, 20 years old are dressed up like dogs, thinking they're dogs, and a nine-year-old is getting on all fours, teasing them for being a dog. Y'all ain't trying to hear. He barking, row, 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 row. and the, the teenager come out, row, 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 row. It was, and they're laughing and videotaping. And I looked at it with sadness. Because we have a generation that does not know who they really are. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Somebody wore pajamas and slippers to the mall one day and forgot their shower cap on their head and it started a movement. Okay, is it me or is y'all seeing this stuff? I was walking through the airport, saw a woman with her shower cap on her head and I'm like, what in the world? When I was raised, you actually wore the shower cap to get in the shower to protect your hair from getting wet so that you could actually do your hair so that when you left the house, your hair looked presentable. But somebody wore a shower cap outside the house one day. And somebody thought it's easier to hide what I really got underneath a shower cap. Oh, come on, y'all ain't trying to help me. It's easier to hide what I really got under a shower cap based on laziness. And if they can be accepted, I can be accepted. So I too can do what they're doing. And it started 
a movement. Somebody thought it was cool to paint eight fingernails the same. but decided to have one on each hand different. So when pan the camera right over there, <laughs> somebody thought it was cool to do it, so they did it, and somebody else saw it. Where are all my ladies in the house that got one finger to put? Yes, he says, and it started. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Because everybody's trying to be and be a part of a movement so that they can fit in. My biggest concern is that this mindset or this attitude has, has crept its way into the church. And, and, and we've been brainwashed to believe that our aim in the kingdom is to blend in with everybody else. So we teach people that my praise ought to look like, oh, y'all gonna help me preach this in a minute, and, and that my dance ought to look like your dance and that my shout ought to look like your shout, but truth be told, you were made different by design. It's, it's really hard to blend in when you were actually born to stand out. You better look at your neighbor and say, baby, he's already preaching. You are, it's really hard to blend in and to fit in. Anybody here just know you don't fit in? You spent all your life trying to fit in, only now to get a revelation that God said you were never created to fit in. As a matter of fact, Peter said that we are a chosen generation. We are a peculiar people. Y'all better help me preach. Peculiar people are people who are strange. They're different. They're, they're not normal. They, they tend to stroke the cat backward. But, but if anybody should celebrate being different, it ought to be people in the kingdom of God. The sole purpose for my message today is to tell you that it's time to embrace who you really are. I need you to look at somebody and say embrace who you really are. Why? Because it's your difference that is going to give you value. It's, it's your difference that's actually going to put money in your pocket and pay you. It, it's your difference that's going to open doors for you. I dare you to high five your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't mess with me because I'm different. I'm, I'm not normal. I'm, I'm really different. So getting back to the text, um, the purpose for the book of Judges is to get these people who are solely dependent upon God to, to move into a monarch system where they had leaders over them. The book of Judges shows up at a peculiar time in the history of Israel. It is during the time where they're going through cycles. At some moment, they're talking about the glory of God and the power of God. And in another moment, they have to repent because of their own faithlessness in God. In, in, in one verse, in one moment, they're, they're praising God for delivering them from the hand of Pharaoh. But in the next moment, they're at the bottom of Mount Sinai worshiping idol gods because they got tired of waiting for Moses to return back from the top of the mountain. And in the book of Judges, we read about 12 judges that are raised, 12 deliverers, 12 saviors, if you would, uh, were raised in order to help Israel during specific times of their history. The people were wanting direction from a man instead of listening for direction from God. And when we, when we get to Judges chapter 3 around verse 12, we see it is what uh, is considered the second judge being raised during another time of Israel's disobedience to God. In, in chapter 3, the children of Israel, they found themselves in trouble once again there. They are under this oppressive rule of a man by the name of King Eglon. And King Anglon, what did he do? He rallied together some of Israel's greatest adversaries. He, he, he rallied together the Ammonites and the Amalekites, and together they came against Israel and defeated them, taking possession of Jericho. So here's a side note. For anyone taking notes, point number one, you can always tell the magnitude of your anointing or the magnitude of your favor based on what's attacking you. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere. When, 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 when your enemies band together to oppose you, not because they're friends with one another, but simply because they share a common enemy, which is you. 
That's how you know you've got something different on you. There's something special about you. And one-on-one, -on -one they know they can't deal with you. They can't handle you. But I come to let somebody know this morning that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I've come to tell somebody this morning that there is no weapon. Come on, somebody. So there's no weapon that is formed against you that shall prosper. Deuteronomy says the Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but they're going to flee from you seven different directions. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Somebody say, I'm a bad mamma jamma. Don't mess with me because I'm different. I'm, I'm not like you. I'm, I'm different. Somebody shout, I'm different. I'm different. So, so, so King Eglon, he, he, he said, I'm not going to deal with Israel by myself. I'm going to rally together some of Israel's greatest adversaries and together they came against Israel and defeated them taking possession of Jericho part of the reason they came against Israel is because God was teaching Israel a lesson God had to allow them to be subdued by their enemies and for 18 years they were stuck under the rulership of the oppressive king by the name of Eglon for 18 years things were bad and only getting worse if you think four years of Trump is bad, okay, that, that messed with some of y'all. These folk, eight, somebody say 18 years. 18 years. But around verse 15, things shift in the narrative. And after 18 years of being, the text teaches us that the people of Israel, what do they do? They cry out to God. My question is, why did it take them 18 years? to decide to, to, to cry out to God. That's the question I'm posing some of you because some of you have been dealing with hell and high water for about 18 years now. Some of you have been going through some stuff beyond the season that it was intended simply because you have refused to cry out to God. Some of you have been hit with life and you think that in and of yourself you have the ability to deal with that which has hit you. But I've come to let you know that God said I'll allow you right there in that cycle. You will not be delivered from it until you get to a place in your life where you throw in the towel. You have a Kelgon take me away kind of a moment. Say God I've tried it on my own strength but I can't do it any longer. God I've been dealing with these kids but I can't do it any longer. God I've been trying to make ends meet, but I can't do it any longer. God, I've been dealing with this sickness in my body, but I can't do it any longer. Sooner or later, God said, I'll sit here and wait for you to get to a place where you are at wit's end, and then you turn and you look to me and say, God, I'm crying out to you. Is there anybody here this morning that's ready to say, God, I'm calling on you this morning. God, it's me standing in the need of prayer. I tried to fix it, but I can't I tried to make it, but I can't make it. I've been trying to do it, but God, I need some help. Somebody stand your feet right now. Give God a praise. Tell God I need you right now. God, I want you right now. You've got to learn to cry. Here's the good news. Be seated. Here's the good news of the text. The good news is that when they finally decide to call on God, yeah. After 18 years, the Bible says that God heard their cry. I don't know about you, but that excites me because I know that I serve a God that always hears me when I pray. Are y'all hearing me? Some folks say that the only prayer of a sinner is that of uh, the, the, the sinner of, you're saying, God, forgive me of my sins. But I'm here to tell you, I don't necessarily agree with that. I know that's an old school teaching. God will not hear the prayer of a sinner, unless it's the prayer of repentance. Nah, no, I really don't agree with that. Uh, why? Because, um, because I know that I know. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me. I, I said I don't agree with it because I know that I know. I said I don't agree with it because I know that I know. I don't, we, how many know that once you know something, it don't matter what somebody else tries to tell you, once you know that you know that you know. 
let me give you an example. Once I was taught that one plus one equals two and two plus two equals four and four plus four equals eight, I don't care who it is that tries to come to tell me that one plus one equals seven. You can't get me to believe that, baby. Why? Because I know that I know that I know. And here's the same thing. You can try and tell some folk that God won't hear your prayer, but I'm here to tell somebody today that I know that I know that I know. Why? Because I was lost and undone and God heard my cry. I was drunk and broken and God heard my cry. I was holding on to the toilet bowl and God heard my cry. I was downtown clubbing and thumping and pumping and God heard my cry. I wasn't living for God, but God heard my Somebody say, I know that I know that I know. I didn't know where to turn, but God heard me. Times when I should have been dead, but God heard me. Times when I was ready to throw in the towel, but God heard me. There were times when I needed a doctor, and I know that God heard me. There were times I needed a lawyer, and I know that God heard me. Times that I needed a friend, and God heard me. I'm excited today because I serve a God who hears me. He hears me on the mountaintop. He hears me in the valley. He hears me wherever I'm at. He said, hello, I'll be with you. Always, I'll be with you. Oh, somebody give God a praise. Somebody shout, he hears me. You get back to the text. I got five minutes. I thank God he hears me. Okay, y'all ain't even buying into that. I'm thanking God he hears me. Some of y'all can't shout because you really don't understand the power of your testimony. I praise the way I praise because God heard me. I preach the way I preach because God heard me. I don't preach the way I preach because I went to Bible seminary. I preach the way I preach because I was lost and undone and God spared my life. I preach the way I preach because when I was broken, God stepped in. I preach the way I preach because I was about to take my life and destroy everything. But God shut down a church service to come and get a broken child like me, a broken drug addict, like me, a broken, oh, y'all ain't trying to help me. God heard, that's why I praise him. That's why I bless him. Cause I I know that I know that I know that God hears. Yeah, you can't get me to believe anything other than that because God, he hears me. Somebody say he hears me. He hears me. So, so, so God, he hears their prayer and, he, and what does he do? He answers them. He decides to raise up a deliverer who is the second judge in the history of Israel. And here's the irony of the text. In order for him to deliver them from King Eglon of Moab, what does he do? He decides to lift up a man by the name of Ehud from the tribe of Benjamin. Is that what your Bible said? I said, is that what your Bible says? Let me read it again. In order for him to deliver the children of Israel from Eglon, he decides to lift up a man by the name of Ehud from the tribe of Benjamin. Okay, some of y'all missed it. Because you missed it because you really don't understand what Benjamin means. Benjamin actually means the son of favor. But it also means the son of the right hand. Oh, y'all. <laughs> Oh, y'all gonna get in the mouth. Come on, I got three minutes to get y'all to get this thing. Someone say the son of the right hand. But the writer of Judges, he made a peculiar footnote concerning Ehud. Ehud was not ordinary. Ehud was not normal. In fact, the writer of Judges teaches us that Ehud was a left-handed man. Is that what your Bible said? But he came from the tribe Y'all see where I'm going, don't you? God said, I'm going to raise up a deliverer. And the man that I choose to raise up is, is going to be left-handed. Did I teach y'all in Bible study that everything that God puts in the word of God has meaning and value? There's a reason why God highlighted that the man was left-handed. 
he didn't just say, oh, he was left-handed, he was right. No, if God said he's left-handed, if you're going to be a Bible scholar, the first thing you ought to ask yourself is, why would God highlight the fact that the man that was born was left-handed? But he didn't just highlight it and say he was left-handed. He said he was a left-handed man from the tribe of the right-handed people. Are, are y'all still hearing what I'm saying? Somebody say, don't mess with me. Don't mess with me. I'm different. I'm different. I'm different. Do y'all see the, the tension in the text? Ehud was left-handed, but he came from a tribe that is called the son of my right hand. The irony here is that God decided to raise up a left-handed man from, a wrong, from among a right-handed people to be their deliverer. And I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but I come by to tell somebody that God is looking to raise up some left-handed deliverers. Oh, y'all are missing what I'm saying. I said God is looking to raise up some left-handed deliverers. He's looking to raise up some people that are different. He's looking to raise up some people that, that operate differently. He, he's looking to raise up a group of people that, that don't look like everybody else. In this world of sameness, this world of normalcy, God is looking for someone who is different. You better slap your neighbor upside the head. Say, baby, I know you're called because you're different. You're different. You're different. God is ready to raise up an army of left-handed warriors who will embrace their calling. Mm. And who realize that if God has entrusted me with this assignment, I don't care if I fit the mold. Mm. I'll do what he's called me to do. I might look different. I might think different. I might act different. But I'm going to do what God has called me to do. I dare you to high five three people and say, neighbor, are you left-handed? Come on, tell them, are, are, are you left-handed? Come on, tell them, that's the wrong prayer. Ask them, are you left-handed? Are you left-handed? Are you all left-handed? Y'all remember that movie, Color Purple? Y'all remember Oprah and the Color Purple? Yes, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> Somebody say, I'm not normal. You know you're not normal when stuff like that just starts coming out of nowhere. That's because you got a special kind of anointing on you. That's because the devil's trying to get you to stop doing what God is calling you to do. But somebody say, I'm not normal. See, that don't happen to normal people. That happens to people that are different. That happens to people that have a special anointing. Y'all remember the movie, The Color Purple? Come on, I'm going to end with this statement. The Color Purple. Y'all remember Oprah? There was a woman in there by the name of Sophia. Sophia had a one-liner. Her liner was, uh, all my life, I had to fight. Is that what she said? Come on, all, anybody here has got the same story? All my life. I had to fight. Some of y'all have been fighting all your life. Here's where you've been fighting though. Many of y'all have been fighting to fit in. Some of y'all have been fighting to be accepted from folk. Fighting to stay under the radar. Some of you have been fighting the urge to not rock the boat. You've been fighting the temptation to speak your mind. You've been fighting the facade of agreement. You know you don't agree with the belief system of mainstream society, yet you just hold your peace and say nothing. You know you have the answer to a lot of people's problems. You just don't want to give your opinion. You've been raised among them, but you don't think like them. You talk, you don't talk like them. Them. You, you don't process like them. You, you have the same last name, but you function on a different operating system. You're different. You're left-handed. I said you're different. You're left-handed. And if you're here the second reason, second service, I'm going to tell you how powerful your difference is. Because some of you are sitting right here right now thinking, God, I don't fit in. God, I don't even think like these folk. God said, no, I didn't call you to think like them. Because if you thought like them, you'd be like them. Oh, come on, y'all ain't trying to help me. Do you know that Betty, one of the first things she told me when she came to the praise team, she said, Bishop, um, do I need to quiet down my praise? She said, Bishop, um, Somebody approached me and told me, um, Daddy, I don't think it takes all that. <laughs> what they don't know is that Betty's left-handed. Y'all ain't talking to me, Ralph. I said, what they don't know is Betty's left-handed. And I told Betty, no, Betty, you 
ain't normal. No, you ain't right. But I'm telling you right now, somebody going to be delivered because you're left-handed. Somebody going to be delivered because of the way you pray. Don't you stop praising now, Betty, because God wants to use your left. You better high-five three people. Say, get ready, baby. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Come on, get ready, get ready, get ready. God is about to use your left hand. You're not normal. You're not going to fit in. You're not going to look like them. You're not going to sound like them. But God is about to get some glory out of your left hand. Somebody jump to your feet. Give God a praise like you're getting your sin. Somebody bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise is in my mouth. Now give him a praise like you believe it. Somebody shout, I'm not normal. I'm left handed. You're not right. <laughs> you're left. You know that God cannot deliver those you're connected to if you are like them. If you like them, you'll blend into them. But God said, you're different. You're di you talk different. You walk different. You think different. You process different. Come on, they, they have conversations and you're looking like, anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, hmm. I know we sitting at the same table, but I don't know if I'm feeling what you're feeling. But for your sake, I'm going to hold my pee. Oh, come on, I can't, I can't tell you how many times I've been in that situation. I, I don't really agree with what you're saying, but, but for your sake, I'm going to shut up right now. But I'm telling you, there's about to be a spirit of boldness that is going to hit every left-handed person. Y'all, I'm, I'm talking to you. Oh, you thought I was talking about a natural left hand? No, baby. I'm talking about left-handed thinking. I'm talking about left-handed doing, yeah. There's a boldness about to hit your life, and it's just a matter of time. You're going to jump up from the table and say, enough is enough. I'm not here to fit in anymore. I'm here to take this thing over for the kingdom of God. Somebody give God a praise in this house. Come on. Somebody give God a praise. Family, I want you to know, you come to the second service, I'm going to tell you about the power in your left hand. Come on and give God a praise. Come on. Yeah. Come on. We're blessed in the So that you may 